And welcome to a very special episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we're recording this in early April 2020, when most of us in the U.S. and Canada are a few weeks into social distancing or lockdown, thanks to the coronavirus. It's very possible that in the very near future, the effects of this disease are going to take a dramatic turn for the worse. But at this point, as we're speaking and recording, those of us who haven't been most immediately affected by the disease, those of us who haven't gotten sick or haven't had loved ones get sick, nevertheless, we're sharing and coping with a lot of other radical changes that have been brought to our lives. So last week, we decided to check in with a few friends to find out how they're doing, how social isolation is affecting them, and and what they're reading, or how this whole situation is affecting their reading habits. Yeah. And our first guest is Irina Dumachescu. You'll remember her from the bonus episode that we did with Irina about food writing last fall. She's a professor of medieval literature at the University of Bonn, but she also has a secret life as a writer of creative nonfiction, especially essays, including one published last year in a volume called How We Read, Tales, Fury, Nothing, Sound, co-edited by me along with Caitlin Heller. Most recently, she had an article in the Times Literary Supplement titled How to Write Well, Rules, style, and the well made sentence. Hello, and welcome back to the Spatter Inn Arena. How are you doing? Amazingly good today, actually. What's the situation where you are? Are you being kept indoors? Well, I'm in Germany and we've been expecting a lockdown, um, but so far we have a ban on getting too close to people. <laughs> so, right. so we are allowed to go outside and we are allowed to go for walks in nature and so on, but we're not allowed to congregate in groups of larger than two, except with people we live with already. And are you are you getting any reading done? Is that a thing that you turn to in these times? <laughs> I'm trying, but I find, okay, I shouldn't admit to this, but I'll admit to this. I have this, I have a really good library, right? I have a very good book collection with my husband. And I've often thought, how great would it be if I had a year just to sit in my apartment and read the books on our shelves, right? So there was a kind of dreamlike situation to being trapped at home with my books. But things being what they are, it turns out to be quite difficult to concentrate on those books. So I find myself bouncing back and forth between two kinds of reading. One are books that call to me because they are about difficult situations. I can't read about plague right now. I have no desire to read about plague, but entrapment or hunger or things like that. And I can only take them in small doses. I can't really stay with that book for very long, but I need to touch base with that feeling, right? Or that acknowledgement of what I'm feeling. And then uh, reading that's escapism, light escapist reading. It's interesting how you said, Chris, that getting reading done. You know, I find myself thinking lately about what is reading for. At least when I use the phrase getting reading done, it's like as if it's a kind of work. It's a Mm -hmm. thing you have to get done, like getting the dishes done or getting the housework done, right? And I find the way I'm thinking about reading is... I want to say light reading, and I don't mean playful reading. I mean like I'm skimming over the surface, like I'm reading a few pages and they're giving me something emotionally, but I'm not processing it or managing it in the more normal way. Are you feeling any of that, Irina? Absolutely. I think that you've just described my mode of reading very well <laughs> right now. I think it's very hard to switch over from this agitated, taking in the news, trying to strategize, how do I deal with a situation? How do I make plans given an uncertain future and the slower pace of reading a book? I think that's quite hard. Now, we were also interested in talking with you because a few years ago, you put out an anthology, a very diverse collection of, of writings, of, of essays and poems and academic writing and memoirs and interviews called Rumba Under Fire, The Arts of Survival from West Point to Delhi. And it's all about the uses that people get in the arts, in the humanities, in texts, in poetry, in music, in all sorts of things like that, in times of crisis. So you've thought about this kind of moment a lot, I suppose. I was prepared. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because Roomba came out in early 2016, and the and the election of Donald Trump was in late 2016. And I often felt that book would have spoken to more people had it come out six months later. Mm. There has not been really any time since then that I haven't thought about it. But right now, it seemed to me almost like the people I wrote about in my own essay were speaking to me again. And my essay in that book was on Romanian political prisoners in the 1950s and 60s and the various kinds of things they did to hold on to their humanity in conditions not only of imprisonment, but also in some cases of extremely brutal psychological torture, right? Mm -hmm. Torture that was intended to break people down. And what people did was people told stories. They taught each other languages. They remembered languages they had learned before. Uh, they wrote entire books and plays and poems and memoirs and histories and scholarly works in their heads. Sometimes when they came out, they rewrote them down on paper and sometimes they didn't. And there was one particular passage, which I, I went back and reread because it was by a woman who, who had been imprisoned when she was quite young. And she at one point was moved to a cell with older women. And she talked about how these older women had a very smart way of going about their imprisonment, which is that they had a very regimented schedule, right? This is when all of this advice about how to schedule your days in, in quarantine <laughs> was going around. I was like, wait a moment, these women knew already. So they would have a schedule and they would have a time for calisthenics and they would have a time for telling stories out of books or movies they'd seen or operas. They would teach each other things, they would discuss things, but they weren't allowed to talk about sad things. Mm. And they would describe recipes, of course, and describe dishes they had eaten. But they had this very regimented schedule that they as a group developed in prison that this memoirist remembers being impressed by because it really sustained them. It kept them going. I find that so moving. Uh, and I went back to that essay, uh, Terpsichore, getting ready for our conversation today. And also to your introduction to that volume, where you said something that I thought was so, so resonant that speaks to the kinds of structures that these women were creating. Um, you say, crisis often creates a space apart from the regular flow of time, one in which individuals can practice art and scholarship. Practicing the arts and humanities during crisis means being able to live out of time with a perspective beyond the mere present. Crises require us to keep time and the arts teach us how to do it. And I thought, you know, thinking about the way in which lacking the external cues for the structure of the day, our household here has kind of internally produced all these cues, these structures, you know, exercising at a particular time, dinner being almost formal in some kind of way, always watching a movie together at the same particular time. And obviously it's totally different from the kinds of crises described in the essays in Rumba Under Fire, or for example, in the, that essay Terpsichore. But I feel like time has become very strange. This was the thing that made me think back to the anthology, because once all of the essays and the poems were together, time came out to be one of the big themes of the book. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that crisis does really strange things to time, right? It stretches out a single moment. At other times, things speed by at a breakneck speed, right? You have no idea what day it is, what's going on. There's a sense of a kind of avalanche of, of information or of events. And I felt that last week I spent all of Wednesday convinced it was Friday. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was experiencing the things I had read about in the book, right? Of how, how everything can be, can be warped, either going much more slowly or much more fast. I've had two of these really uncanny moments, and I'm curious whether either of you have experienced these two moments where I feel like I'm looking forward to a time in the future when I'll look back at this moment. So, for example, uh, the very last time I was in a gathering with my extended family when this crisis was just just beginning to unfold. So we sort of, there was no lockdown or anything like that, but there was a sense that we we're going to need to be thinking about gatherings. And there was a birthday party for a, a child cousin of mine. And we were singing happy birthday to her. And in that moment, I was looking around the room and thinking, well, what will it be like to look back at this time when we were all together, what, you know, not knowing when we'll be together again, you know, look, looking into the future as if back at the past, which was the present moment. And then I had a very similar experience about a week ago when I was just sort of cutting up some berries for, for breakfast. And I was thinking to myself, will it be hard to get these thinking about what will it be like in the future to think about this time if I don't have these for a period, you know, so, so this looking forward 
and looking back kind of dislocation. I've had this happen a couple times because I guess the time of crisis is a turning point, right? Well, it's. I think there's something about trauma that fixes things in the memory too. But at the same time, memory is a is a way to work through trauma. So I, I wonder if you're putting signposts on your life so that if things should get worse, which for many people they will, right? You have these memories to hold on to as a kind of structure as well. Could that be it? Mm, that makes a lot of sense. It's so interesting how these like Zoom or online conversations like. Obviously, those are important and have always been important, like with people that you know and you're fond of and so on. But even like people I hardly know, like, you know, I've been having like virtual meetings of various sorts, and they're always starting with this incredible kind of ethic of care. Like, how are you? Are you feeling well? How's your space? How's your family? You know, there's always like five minutes of, you know, care. (laughs) And I'm like, I hope we keep this because it's like so nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's really weird. I've been writing to people, just trying to check in on the three people a day, either here or far away, and just sort of find out what's going on with them. Um, And actually, I mean, why don't I do that usually? I don't know. Mm -hmm. They're fast emails to write. They don't take Mm -hmm. a lot, you know, a little Mm -hmm. phone call. But yeah. My friend Nadia pointed out that with everybody under house arrest, so to speak, that through the internet, all of our friends are exactly as far apart from each other. Yes. Yeah. And that means that the urgency of the people who are physically proximate to you and, you know, the people you're going to see every day, that that isn't there. And so you have the sort of mental space to focus like you're doing on, you know, pick three people a day because you're not taking as much time with all the people that you run into. Yeah. And the people you run into are the people you live with. So you can, you can yeah, spend so a few minutes. You're used to ignoring them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I recognize this is all bad, but on the other hand, there's so much new and interesting and things I hope don't go away. But this is, I mean, this is actually the thing that was tricky in writing Roomba Under Fire, though I think it's not really a problem. It's it's how do you appreciate the value that comes out of a crisis without romanticizing it, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. when the walls fell in on the Eastern Bloc, when after Romania's revolution, mm-hmm. there were for a while lines to buy books, right? The lines to buy books were as long as the lines had been to buy bread before or potatoes or whatever you'd you'd heard would be available. And then that that disappeared at some point. Nobody lines up for books anymore in Romania. But there was a time then once there was the freedom to read things from outside, the people were lining up and it didn't matter, just as it hadn't mattered what food was at the end before, it didn't matter what, what book was at the end of that line. And I heard so many stories from family members and friends about how books, foreign books would be passed in manuscript copies among teenagers who would read, who would have one night each to read the book. And so they'd, you know, cover up the window of their door and read it under the cover with a flashlight. So, because then they would have to pass it on to somebody else the next day, right? Yeah. Nobody cares about literature as much as they do during bad times. And that's the sort of perversity because I carry that knowledge with me. I know that what I do with my students in the classroom I don't think the point of what I do with my students in the classroom is to teach them some kind of critical skills or theory this or theory that. I'm laying up a foundation for their bad times. I'm using all that critical stuff in the university, blah, 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 as an excuse to teach them those things. But what I'm doing is I'm laying up a foundation for their future crises. Because I don't know, it may be when they're 35 or when they're 65 or when they're 95, there might be a moment when they need to turn to one of these books again, or they need to remember that they used to be a person who read, or they need to have a continued practice of reading and interpretation. And so I'm on a stealth mission in the university <laughs> because I know these things are valuable, but they're not valuable in the moment when you have the the luxury to treat it as this kind of um unimportant flighty subject but you know at a at a university that unserious students take instead of doing math or engineering or business or something like that i think it's vital it just doesn't look vital in the moment so that's the irony that you understand its vitality in the worst moments of your life <laughs> and in the worst moments of your society
listening to Irena talk about having poetry when you need it, having it kind of stored away, reminded me of this article I read earlier today about preserving or canning food. It was an article about somebody's grandmother and how she used to always grow lots of things in her garden, but then also put them up in jars to save. And it's a little bit like that almost, you know, um, literature having this kind of regenerative quality, this quality of growth, this quality of sustaining you. It's interesting to see what it is we're turning to for sustenance of all different kinds right now. That's a really interesting metaphor, especially because one of the effects of canning and preserving food is to change how it tastes. Mm. And the idea that the reading of a piece of literature in the moment is very different from what it's like once you've pickled it in your brain, so to speak, once you've stored it away, like it's going to come back to you changed. Anyway, let's move on to our second guest. Our second guest is Cor J. Whitaker. He's a Philadelphia native whose lifelong relationship with the African Methodist Episcopal Church led him to fall in love with Chaucer and medieval literature. Today, an associate professor at Wellesley and an internationally known speaker, Cord Whitaker regularly writes and lectures on blackness in the Middle Ages, on white supremacist deployments of the Middle Ages, and on African-American political medievalism. His most recent book is Black Metaphors, How Modern Race Emerged from Medieval Race Thinking. Cord, thank you for joining us. How are you doing these days? Well, you know, Chris, I think for many of us, it's really quite a wild time right now. I have, I think like anyone, been through my moments of panic and disbelief, as well as finding myself regretful that I did not fully expect the magnitude of the disruptions we'd have here in in North America. I've been reading about the coronavirus crisis for months, really since it began. And, and so keeping up with something for that length of time, I feel like I should have been more mentally prepared for the impact than I, I now think I was. I find people are finding ways to impose order on their lives, whether it's making lists or giving structure to their day, you know, creating a kind of order for themselves in terms of time and space that we used to be able to have externally imposed on us by these exterior schedules and so on. Are you finding it either in terms of time or space that's happening for you? Uh, absolutely. I mean, being in a family unit, right, there's sort of natural rhythms that develop. Uh, of course, ours have had to change. Much of my time now goes to homeschooling. So the, the, the rhythm is, it's both internally and externally imposed. It's now a matter of negotiating needs and desires with the other members of my household, especially the child. So, you know, the way I've devised it, we now begin homeschooling about 9.30. Mm -hmm. which honestly for me is a much more acceptable time than the time her school actually starts. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we all get to sleep in a little bit. And then uh, at 9.30, we have a dance party to start <laughs> off the day. Nice. Oh, good way to start the day. It is. It is. It gets the wiggles out and and gets the blood flowing. And then we turn to one of several subjects. We turn to either reading and writing, math, Spanish, French, or music. And it's her choice, uh, which we start with nice. on that given day. I like the way you're describing a kind of a structured day that has order to it, but also has space for chaos to happen. You know what I mean? In other words, the chaos is safely contained within the order, as when she chooses what subject you're going to begin with, for example, or the dancing. Yeah, I, I, I try to do that because I also feel, given everything that's going on in the world, I feel somewhat internally chaotic. Mm -hmm. So I realized mm -hmm. I was going to have definitely have to make space for this for a five-year-old, you know, who is probably feeling quite a lot of the same, but can't articulate it the same way. You were talking about doing homeschooling. It made me think that when we ask you about what you're reading, one of the things you must be reading is reading for that homeschooling or reading in the act of that homeschooling, reading together, reading aloud, all these kinds of things. So is that a part of what's going on with you in terms of reading right now? Absolutely. We happen to be reading Frank L. Baum's Wizard of Oz. Oh, I love those books. It's just so wonderful. Uh-huh. You know, and it's taking me back. I read the whole thing when I was about 11 or 12 on my own. 
and have always been a great fan of the of the Technicolor film too. And so we uh, we've embarked on a reading of it. We've also rewatched the film, which I hadn't shown her in about a year. And we've had wonderful experience comparing the text and the film. Also recognizing that we keep finding new things every time we return. If we go back in the book a little bit and sort of start a few pages before we ended, we notice new things. Since this was the second time I've shown her the film, she noticed new things in the film, and honestly, so did I, even after, you know, my umpteenth viewing of the film. (laughs) And so that's really been quite a lot of fun, thinking about the magic of narrative Mm -hmm. and how the same text can continually reveal new things to you. That's neat how what you're doing at home and that homeschooling is something very different from the kinds of things that would be happening in the classroom in the normal course of things. I mean, kids are usually much older by the time they're getting the chance to think about film adaptations as opposed to a book that they're reading together. So that's kind of neat opportunity. It is fun. It is fun. You know, if, if, if anything, she is suffering the plight of being the child of a professor of literature, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So what else are you reading? What's on your bedside table? Oh, my goodness. My bedside table is a rough place right now because, <laughs> because one, because I am so tired from, you know, from this new, this change of life, right? And then, uh, of course, in the stolen moments when I'm not teaching my daughter, um, I'm also reading panic-driven New York Times articles and local news updates about the latest numbers. Uh, so all that does leave one pretty tired at the end of the day. But I have been slowly working my way through the Watchmen graphic novel series, which is, you know, a sort of delightful superhero noir uh, uh, romp, really. So I've, I've been enjoying that immensely. Have you read it before or have you seen the movie? I've never read The Watchmen before. And I've and I've never seen the the filmic version either. But I am someone who loves noir, so this is really neat. I, I'm enjoying it. It's I think appropriately dark for the period we're going through, yet also fantastical enough to take one out of that period for or take one out of our current situation for a little bit. It's so interesting. You know, sometimes in conversations with people, they'll talk about comfort reading being like, you know, you know, the books that are very familiar, the books you've read a million times. But reading new things can also provide a very different kind of comfort um, if they're well chosen. It sounds like The Watchman's doing that for you. It is. It really is. Um, I've also been taking a look back at a favorite sci-fi short story collection of, of mine from the early 2000s by the detective fiction author, Walter Mosley, who is certainly known as a very important, popular African-American author, but who's also known as a great writer of noir detective fiction, regardless of, you know, regardless of the race of his characters or his own race. It's called Futureland, and it's one of his lesser known writings because it's not detective fiction. It's sci-fi. Some have called it Afrofuturist. And, and in many ways it is, but it's also not. And one of those reasons is it, it takes place in a future around the year 2055 where we humans believe ourselves, and at least believe ourselves, to have outgrown race. Hmm such that all the usual racial markers don't apply. And then, of course, the, the text does, does betray its own interests in race and in that it's being very explicit when 2055's versions of the Nazis appear. They call themselves the Itzies. <laughs> and they are described as, you know, basically doing a sort of historical thing. And they look back and they say, these Nazis were right, and we want to reinstitute race and racial hierarchy. And the way they do that 
is they develop, or at least a, a, an itsy sympathizing scientist develops a plague. So it's very fitting for mm -hmm. our current moment. He develops a plague, and this plague is meant to only attack and kill people of color, specifically black people. However, things go awry. Those who would get rid of this plague, they do get hold of it. They destroy some of it. They irradiate some of the pathogen, hoping that would destroy the rest of it. But it turns out the irradiation, in fact, just flips the effect. Mm. And now the plague only attacks and kills people who have less than 12.5% African DNA. Huh. So all of a sudden, the only people who are immune are people who identify as Black. Huh. At the same time, a number of people who identify as white and who are, are phenotypically white get revealed to actually have more African DNA than they thought. That's so weird. Yeah. If they're fine, if they're immune, then they're clearly more than 12.5% African. Wow. It strikes me in some ways that there's a weird symmetry between your homeschooling reading, you know, The Wizard of Oz, and this reading, the, the Mosley's Futureland, that even though The Wizard of Oz is like a much older book, it's also weirdly future-oriented, right? It's fantasy literature, but it's got a very futuristic kind of edge to it somehow. I, th I think that's absolutely right. Um, certainly the way that the Emerald City is described in both in both the book and in the film, it is a futuristic city, it is a place where almost anything is possible. Yeah, the Yellow Brick Road's even been interpreted as a reference to the gold standard. Absolutely. So there's an economic argument to be made. I hope you've been teaching your daughter about that reading the text. <laughs> I have. <laughs> oh, I certainly <laughs> have. Um, we have addressed the fact that, you know, in, in the book, the slippers are silver. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I do buy the reading that, yes, he's debating the silver standard versus the gold standard there. Whereas, of course, in the movie, they're changed to ruby because it shows up better in Technicolor. Exactly. All right. So, yes, Chris, I kind of have been teaching my five-year-old about the gold standard. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> like I said, she's going to have the problems that children of professors have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my son can commiserate with her. <laughs> Hearing Cord talk about teaching his daughter at home makes me think about how many of us are coping with, well, often complicated family situations one way or the other. But in particular, I'm thinking about dealing with kids at home. I mean, for me, I've got four kids, but they're mostly grown up. Usually there's only one still living at home. But right now I have my third daughter and her boyfriend at home too. So the house is full. And interestingly, how can I put it? Even people in their 20s somehow become about, you know, eight when they're living at home with their siblings. And it's not that it's that hard for me at home. I, I know friends who have like really small kids at home or kids who are of a young enough school age that they need a lot of support. And I think those who are living alone right now are maybe in some ways in the hardest position of all. But um, the family dynamic has been really something to to reckon with. And it's changing over time, I find. I don't know if you find that too. Well, I don't know. From my perspective, from my family, you know, my husband and I are not tearing each other's hair out yet. And my cat is delighted that I'm home all the time. <laughs> Although I think even she's getting a bit sick of me. This is the big plus of this whole awful situation, right? Like the, the animals at home are delighted, but they will be sick of us before long, I suspect. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So our third guest is Oriana Schwint. She's a freelance writer based in New York with bylines in New York Magazine, Vice, and Fox. And she's also one of the co-hosts of By the Bywater, a podcast all about everything J.R.R. Tolkien, hosted right here at Megaphonic FM. She's also thinking about restarting her podcast about grift in America. It's called American Grift. And in 2017, she experienced this grift firsthand on a crowdfunded reporting trip to the geographic center of every state in America. Yep, she did all 50. No, she says, your state isn't her favorite. 
Hello, Oriana. Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so thrilled to be part of this cross-pollination effort. Yeah, I'm especially interested in how our conversation is going to go because I've enjoyed some of your episodes of By the Bywater because that's a book that speaks to me a lot. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about it today. You certainly will get a chance. I promise <laughs> you that. So how are you doing? How How is all this affecting you? How are you coping with it? Uh, really poorly. I am not... <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Not to bring everything, but it is. It's it's really strange times. I'm a freelance writer, and everything is very up in the air, work wise. And so, in in my hour of need, I have turned to one of the things that gives me great comfort in this world, and that is the Fellowship of the Rings, specifically, not just the Lord of the Rings. You would expect someone who does a Tolkien podcast to turn to the Lord of the Rings in comfort, but there's something about the Fellowship of the Ring in particular that that really just, it soothes me. Last night, I pulled the Fellowship of the Ring off the shelf. I've read it a million times, and it was funny that the copy I pulled off the shelf wasn't the one I tend to read more often these days, which is one I bought for my kids some years ago, but the really ratty, three-volume, mm. very deteriorated box set mm-hmm. that I got when I was like 12 years old. And I was thumbing through the pages and, you know, getting that, you know, familiar sort of comforting feeling of reading the opening, and I was like, the the bookiness is also doing something for me. Um, and so it's interesting you talking about the opening book of the trilogy and like where it takes you, which is different from the rest of the books and also reading them in different editions, different from that too, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I have, uh, I've gone through a few uh, editions of uh, the Lord of the Rings and Silmarillion. I'm on my third copy of the Silmarillion. I have a copy of the Two Towers that is the original one that I got. Uh, and I, <laughs> I've i told this story on By the Bywater, but the Two Towers was actually the first book of the Lord of the Rings that I read because oh, wow. <laughs> huh. I, I had read The Hobbit and saw this copy of the Two Towers in uh, some store somewhere as a as a 12 year 11 12 year old and was like oh it's the same guy i would like to read that and you know cajoled whoever was with me to to buy it for me and then was hopelessly confused Mm. Uh, (laughs) and uh for like you know i got pretty far into it before realizing oh this is this is the second one. Okay. Yeah, like it starts in the middle of the things. Yeah. You know? It'd be hard yeah, to you are. like I was like, oh, <laughs> I think we had just learned about in medias res in school. And I was like, oh, this is in medias res. Cool. <laughs> 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 Did you ever have the big red volume, like the big no. one volume version of it? I inherited one from like an uncle or something <gasps> like that at one point. And that was one that, that I don't know if you ever seen it. It's like printed with red ink yeah. for some of the headers. And it's like purposely kind of trying to do the, not manuscripty exactly, but like to kind of heighten that feeling of antiquity or something like that. And obviously, you know, the red binding is meant to be like the red the book red of book. West. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, I'm I, at some point I want to get my hands on one of those that would enhance the comfort <laughs> for sure. So what is it about the first book? You know, I think it's the Shire in particular. Mm-hmm. I, I, I tend to go like when I really need something solid beneath my feet. I focus on the Shire, like in the beginning of Fellowship, uh, which, you know, it takes a real long time Mm -hmm. to get out of the Shire. (laughs) I can only imagine what people who were first reading it back when it first came out, what what they thought is like, can we, are we, are we going yet? Uh Um, But I, I love that now in particular. It's, it's so pastoral. It's so, Quaint. And there is that feeling of appreciating the beauty before you, essentially, and and understanding that it is precious and uh, in peril. Yeah, in peril. And, and you know, you're making me think about an earlier part of our conversation today where we were talking about how life is feeling very chaotic, right? And so I think for a lot of us, we're trying to developing new ways of giving internal order, whether it's ordering our home spaces or ordering our day in ways that we didn't have to do before because we had external cues. 
Like when I get up in the morning, I'm like, I feed the cats, I water the plants, mm-hmm. I plant these window boxes and I deal with them. And then I go running. You know what I mean? It's like all this like bodily care, bodily care of the cats and the plants and me. And these are not things that I thought about at all. And you know what I mean? But like but when you were saying about in Fellows 3, like, you know, like, the things that are right before you are all of a sudden incredibly visible. Mm-hmm. And the Shire is like that, right? Exactly. You know, Frodo walks around saying, I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley ever again. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Will I ever go to the grocery store in the same way ever again? <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> you know, we don't know. Yeah, we have a feeling of a turning point, right? And we don't know what's on the other side of that. Exactly. Is there a sense that that sort of thinking is why you wouldn't want to continue on to the rest of the trilogy? Oh, yeah, for sure. That is actually, (laughs) I definitely do plan on stopping and maybe actually fast forwarding to the scouring of the Shire. I was just going to say. The returning of order. Exactly. Where it's shocking what's happened, but there's the work of repair as possible. Exactly. And it flowers, right? In this really dynamic way. Exactly. And then you have the really moving and beautiful idea of, well, what if you return and it's no longer yours? You can't, you find you can't stay there, which uh, I am planning. I love New York. I didn't ever think I would love New York. Uh, That's where I live. I live in Queens. Uh, I have lived here since 2008. And I'm supposed to be moving to Los Angeles in the fall. (laughs) <laughs> we'll see what happens there. But it, do, it, I'm, it, it does very much have me in the mind of, oh, wow, I, all, I too am going to have to go into the West. Well, it's not quite such a permanent move, maybe. <laughs> I, you know, I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so besides Lord of the Rings, what else are you reading? Like, what else is on your bedside table? Is it mostly fantasy or are you reading other sorts of things? Surprisingly, I haven't been able to read fiction, like new fiction in a couple of years now. And I don't know. I feel like I've seen some other people talk about this. I, how have you guys, I mean, you know, you have to read fiction. No, it's so interesting that you say that, Oriana, because even though we're reading fiction regularly, you know, for The Spotter Inn, it kind of came out of that experience. Like, I was reading fiction insofar as I needed to read it for, you know, teaching purposes. And I was reading a lot of nonfiction and really engaged with creative nonfiction, but I could not read fiction. And so coming into doing The Spotter Inn with Chris, in a way for me, was an opportunity to reconnect with that material that I had felt so much passion and so much emotion about. And so it's, I'm only slowly now becoming open to reading reading fiction again in the ways that I had done before. So it's it's weird. Like you said, it, I think we're not the only ones to be experiencing this. I'll add that I basically stopped reading, period, but especially reading fiction during the end of my grad school. Mm. And uh, there's a whole lot behind that. But I think part of it is just that uh, I, I can often find it very difficult to get into a new world. Once I'm there, it's usually okay. But like transitioning into the new world is very difficult for me. So starting things is always a problem and short stories can be Mm. just terrifying because you have to keep going into new worlds and new worlds and new worlds. Yeah. And so the trauma and the the stress of grad school for me really, you know, stopped that for me. And I can imagine that for a lot of people, the stress of this situation, which I'm not quite comparing to grad school, but, you know, stress is stress. (laughs) Um, yeah, no, that's that, true. that that could cause a lot of difficulty with that. I mean, I still haven't gone back to reading poetry, right? Which is sort of where I come from. I haven't, I keep buying it, but I haven't actually really read poetry except for the stuff that we've read on the Spouter Inn, which is kind of different. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really read poetry on my own for pleasure in years. And it's this huge hole in my life and my reading life. Yeah. I wonder where that's coming from. It's, I mean, different places, obviously, but the fact that a lot of us are sharing it is kind of telling. I don't know if it comes from changes in our reading practice. And like you said, the the barrier to entry into another world is very different from the experience of reading creative nonfiction. It, it is it is interesting because I was I was a well I actually I saw a tweet <laughs> that um, that really resonated with me. It was from someone who was having a similar. Uh, problem of, of just kind of feeling burned out and unable to to read the things that they wanted to. Um, and it was, you know, I was a voracious reader as a child. And uh, the tweet, you know, said that, well, 
you know, when you were a kid, reading was sort of a coping mechanism for a lot of us. Right? Certainly for me, um, it was my escape. And, you know, now there's much less, well, I mean, the world is <laughs> blowing up, but there, there isn't quite that, um, need to escape to survive. I, as an adult, have so many other options now to, you know, retreat from reality. That's such a neat point. You're absolutely right. I was thinking about the yeah, as a child. I also was a big reader and it was a way to be alone while you were with other people. Yeah. So my mom wanted to go shopping. I would take a book and we would go and she would park me in a corner and I'd read my book. Or if I had to be out because family was over, I'd be in the living room, but I'd be in a chair with my book. Yep. <laughs> you know, I, it, like they weren't there in a sense, right? It was also a way to have autonomy, right? An agency. Yes. Mm. And and I imagine this is why people who only read when they were assigned stuff in school have a very different relationship with reading because mm. they don't have any autonomy in what they're reading. But for those of us who are just diving into books and cajoling our parents or whoever to buy us books that you know we barely understood uh, at the bookstore, like, yeah, get this for me. Mm-hmm. Let's see what this is like. Or had a library card and didn't have a lot of supervision as to what we read with it. Like, yeah, no, this is this is the one space that I have control over. Whereas now as an adult, well, obviously I don't have control over everything. I have a lot more control over all sorts of things. Yeah. Reading was like a space, but also like, almost like a weapon in a way, like a way to keep the world at bay. Yes, absolutely. And there is also like, you know, I was treated very much as a, as a gifted child. And that was one of the ways. And, you know, it was like, oh, well, you can't bother me while I'm reading because I'm reading. It's very important for <laughs> me as a gifted child to be to be reading. So it, it really it was a cudgel <laughs> in a way. <laughs> That's absolutely right. It gave you a kind of power, like a, a power over other people in a weird kind of way. I never thought of it that way. It's so interesting you say that. So when we were talking with Oriana, we mentioned that both of us had recently had trouble reading and that this podcast has been a really useful way for us to get back into reading, especially reading fiction. And I'm curious what you're reading now. I mean, we've asked everybody else. We should fess up to what we're reading, right? Yeah. Well, I'm reading two books. One I'm reading during the day and one I'm reading at bedtime. And interestingly enough, I'm reading both of them very, very slowly. And so one of them, the one I'm reading during the day, is this book called Braiding Sweetgrass. That's by Robin Wall Kimmerer. The subtitle is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Kimmerer is a botanist, so she's got a PhD in botany. She has an academic position where she teaches this subject right at a university level. But she's also someone who's been deeply committed to Indigenous ways of knowing, of knowledge about plants and other growing things from a very early stage in life, and she's cultivated that side of her knowledge. And in this book, she talks about, uh, I don't think she uses this phrase, but I've seen it used elsewhere by Indigenous writers who are talking about scientific or Western epistemologies, this idea of two-eyed seeing, that you can draw on those Western epistemologies, that scientific method, and also be engaged in other modes of knowing, other kinds of knowledge that are grounded in Indigenous teaching and Indigenous ways of doing things over time. And these are not mutually exclusive. They don't cancel one another out. Together, they get you a different kind of knowledge. They get you to a different kind of place. Anyway, this it, it sounds dry when I describe it, but in Kimmerer's book, it comes alive. So I've been getting huge pleasure out of this book. And it's also complementing the other task that I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of, which is planting uh, a balcony garden. So having dirt on my hands and having that book in my hands has felt really mutually sustaining. And my nighttime reading is um, Lord of the Rings. I've been reading um, The Fellowship of the Ring. I know Ariana will be really happy to hear that. And it's a book I read for the first time when I was like, I don't know, 11 or 12. Um, and you get reading it very, very slowly. But this time, because it's so familiar and so comforting, and it's like climbing in between the sheets to read this book. I mean, literally, I'm climbing in between the sheets, but it's like emotionally climbing between the sheets. Oh, that's fantastic. I will say that my local bookstore is still delivering books to people, and I have finally broken down and put in an order for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Oh, great. So it's on its way. But in the meantime, (laughs) I've been reading Octavia Butler's a four book series, the Patternist series, which have been collected into one volume called Seed to Harvest. And these are the first books of Octavia Butler's that I read. And this is my first time rereading the entire series. 
I've never read her work yet, but I'm really excited to. She's fantastic. I completely love her. Many of her books are about big crises hitting humanity and changing what it means to be human. But it's always this complicated thing because the radical changes that happen to humanity in Butler's books, they have pluses and they have minuses. And it's about how people deal with this radical change to themselves and how they form small communities to try to work through this change. And there is a tomorrow, right? I mean, they go through these crises, but there's a tomorrow, right? It's a very different tomorrow, but there is ultimately, I think, usually something deeply hopeful about these books. They're all about people sort of gathering together and and figuring it out and 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 making it work. And I and I quite enjoy that. Plus, they're just they're smart, but they're really easy to read. Mm. The other thing, of course, that I've been doing is playing a lot of Animal Crossing, just as everybody else has. I have noticed this. Yes. It's a lovely little video game about going to an island and making lots of animal <laughs> friends and building up your house and trying on different outfits and doing all sorts of little tasks. Everything is delightful. It is so smartly written. It's so, there's, I mean, not smart as in like deep and profound, smart as in just a joy at every moment. And as a recent Polygon video from our friends over at Polygon pointed out, Infinite Jest has 450,000 words and Animal Crossing has 600 or so thousand words. Therefore, Animal Crossing is better. Oh, that's clear. Exactly. <laughs> Well, our final guest is Carla Millett, who is a professor of Italian and Middle East Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her work focuses on the relationship between literary traditions in the medieval Mediterranean, especially Arabic, Latin, and Romance vernacular languages. Her earlier books include The Kingdom of Sicily, 1100 to 1250, and European Modernity and the Arab Mediterranean. And she's just finishing a new one called Lives of the Great Languages, Cosmopolitan Languages in the Medieval Mediterranean, which is something I absolutely have to read. Hello, Carla. Welcome to The Spatter Inn. How are you doing? Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, I am reeling at the surreal new world in which we're all living, which I think everybody is doing at this moment in time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, on, on balance. It's good. How is this all affecting you where you are right now? Yeah, Michigan is about to get it. Michigan is about to get a wallop from what we understand. But so far, Ann Arbor has been relatively calm. Uh, the University of Michigan, where I teach, converted all classes to virtual classes and gave us only two days to make the transition which was interesting. Um, but um, the transition was relatively easy for me because I'm teaching a lecture course. I'm teaching Dante, in fact, the Divine Comedy. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it's, that is relatively easy to transition over much easier than if you have a discussion class, for instance. Are you finding that like your structure of your everyday life is changing in certain ways? Like, oh, some people talk about how their sense of their personal space has changed or their way in which they structure the shape of their day, you know, because commuting isn't a thing anymore. But, you know, everything else has changed. Oh, radically, radically. I mean, I'm on campus five days a week. You know, at this point in the academic year, it's relentless. It's an onslaught. It just doesn't end, you know. I'm still preparing lectures. I'm still uh, recording lectures and you know, delivering them. I'm still grading student papers, um, you know, but it's all kind of in this weird uh, confine. I mean, okay. I know that you guys have just talked about the Decameron. You remember in the introduction to the Decameron when Boccaccio describes in graphic detail, the, the kind of, of narrow and straightened lives that women lead. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I think like we're all kind of there now. You know, mm -hmm. we're all living out our lives within these really contained spaces. And it's just, you know, it's something completely rad. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. Mm. Has your reading of Dante changed in this moment? Well, um, where we are right now is that we're getting close to the end of purgatory. And so you know, there's a lot going on there. And a lot of it is not relevant to the present moment. But I do think, judging from the students' responses, I suspect that the students are looking at Dante with this new sense of urgency, right? Oh, with wow. a new sense of kind of, um, you know, thinking about what they can get from Dante, what they can take away from Dante um, in a way that maybe they didn't before all of these upheavals. Obviously, some students are crazy distracted. There's a lot going on in their lives. Um, but those who are have landed in a safe and quiet place and have the broadband, have the bandwidth to uh, to download the lectures and respond to them, they're really doing deep dives into the text and really asking fascinating questions. 
It's going to be, especially as the term, well, the term, whatever this is, goes on, it'll be interesting to see how their responses develop. Like, in other words, if Dante is giving them something, I don't know, affectively, emotionally, in different ways from the way it would take place in a regular lecture kind of setting and with different pressures. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, the problem is, of course, is that as you get into the Paradiso, oh, you know, I mean, how do you teach the Paradiso? Mm. The, you know, the, the Inferno, I'm sorry to say, just teaches itself. I mean, the students love the, you know, they can do this all day long. But, you know, and, and the Purgatorio is my favorite. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that is the correct opinion. <laughs> <laughs> right. <on. laughs> but, um, uh, you know, but it is, it's a bit of a harder sell, but, you know, we're having fun with it at the moment but the paradiso is just so abstract you know and it's so i think difficult to follow i switch up the translations when we get to the paradiso because i use a the mandelbaum which i think is you know a bit more accessible as poetry Mm -hmm. um and i think that it's just there's just you know too much there if you're trying to slog through the notes and you know one of the more you know drilling and martinez which is what i read for the inferno and purgatory but still it's just you, you can't rush through it. So what else are you reading? Like, what are the things on your bedside table or wherever it is you read? So um, as I was preparing, I actually, what I did was I went down to my local comic store mm-hmm. and I got some graphic novels. Oh, awesome. I approach reading comics the same way that I approach reading poetry, you know, in the sense that comics are like, it's a narrative art, right? It's time-based. You're reading, there's a destination. You're reading in order to kind of, you know, get to the end of the story. But then there's always these moments when time stops, right? And so you stop and you look at pictures and you kind of like, you just kind of fall into the world of the pictures and you parse the pictures, you read the pictures, you know, the, the pictures are telling a story. They're, they're, they're helping to tell the story, obviously. Um, and they're often kind of um, adding information that you're not getting from the words. And there's something that I just find absolutely seductive about that, about the aesthetic experience of reading comics. So I was, I've been reading the series, I Am a Hero by Kengo Hanazawa, which is a manga, which I absolutely love. Um, I've been reading a series called Velvet, which is kind of like a James Bond series. The main character is a woman called Velvet. Um, I got a new book by Isabel Greenberg called Glass Town, The Imaginary World of the Brontes. Oh, yes. I've seen that about. How is it? It's really, 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 really good. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it, it's because um, she kind of takes you into the world that the Brontes invented. And there's a very porous boundary between worlds in the book. So you're sometimes you're occupying the world of the Bronte, sometimes you're occupying, you know, kind of their imaginary world. And, and, and it's kind of fascinating. It sounds awesome. Now you mentioned graphic novels being sort of like poetry in some ways. Are you reading poetry as well lately, or is that something that's not happening right now? Um, no, I mean, it's in my mind. Like I, do, I always have, you know, books of poetry around that I can turn to and, and I've, you know, kind of thought about, oh, who would I read? Who, you know, if I was going to pick up a book of poetry, who is it that, you know, who am I feeling right now? But I haven't started. I haven't gotten there yet. I have exactly the same feeling. I keep feeling like I want to be reading poetry and nothing seems right. Nothing makes it off the shelf into my hand. I keep feeling like I should do the thing that a lot of people are saying they're doing and reading something ambitious. And especially with poetry, there are some, you know, big, fat, imposing poetry volumes that I've picked up meaning to read someday. And, you know, it feels like now should be the time since I'm not leaving the house or anything, but it's just, it's just impossible for me to think about tackling something that much right now. I I just want to turn to old familiar things. Sure. Yeah. Comfort reading. Yeah. You know, I mean, for me, the part of the pleasure of poems is that they're so short. (laughs) Oh, well. You know, I mean, I like lyric poetry, like Mary Shibist. She has, do you know her book, Incarnadine? Oh, yeah. I ran across that about a year, year and a half ago. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I bought it for somebody else and I gave it away, but I read it really quickly before I gave it away. And now I, I, I regret it because I really wish I still had it. Gorgeous. I love that book. Love it. Yeah, no. I mean, short poems are probably a good idea. I should probably dig out some of my favorite ultra minimalist poets. Well, there's a certain pleasure, right? They're short and you can kind of... You can contemplate them for as long as you want to. I think a lot of people um, found it irresistible to think about Boccaccio's Decameron over the last little while, um, partly because of thinking about 
you know, pandemic, literature of pandemic, right? But also because something so interesting happens in there where people seek out their individual health, not on their own, but collectively, right? And so individual health is dependent on communal health. And story has a certain kind of role in that, you know, so improving your frame of mind and engaging in a certain kind of interaction brings you to another place mentally and emotionally. And so Chris and I recorded an episode on the decamera and talking a lot about the frame, but also about a few of the tales. And I know that's a text you know well and have taught and thought about over a long time. Has it been in your mind too? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. A lot of people have been talking about it. I think it's, it's just, as, it's inevitable, isn't it? Um, yeah. The, the epiphany at the end of uh, Griselda, um, exactly what you were just talking about, right? Where you get one interpretation after another of that story, that sad dreary story of, of Griselda, which is such a, like, you know, it's, it's such a dark place to end this absolutely, you know, like exultant and, you know, ecstatic book. Right. But then at the end, when you've got all of those different interpretations, of the story of, of Griselda le- leading out into the frame, you know, that I think is like a gorgeous epiphany and a place, you know, where, where people come together to chew over the story to say, oh, what do you think it means? Oh, I think it means this, you know? Yeah, no, Chris and I were talking about that very moment like that you put your finger on and um, as being the time when people are ready to engage in debate and, you know, to disagree, but to get somewhere with that and to be in a state of mind where they're able to think about going back to Florence because they're, you know, mentally at least or emotionally in a different place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's that kind of, um, you know, narrative as it's therapeutic, obviously, right? It's, it's purging, you know, it's in many ways, (laughs) My favorite moment where that happens is in the Frate Cipolla story, which uh-huh. is um, the last story on day six. Can you describe it really briefly? Um, so this, if I, it's been a while since I've read it, um, if memory serves. Uh, the story is that there are um, there are a couple of guys who are kind of um, small scale operators in the town of uh, Certaldo, which is where Boccaccio is actually from. Hometown, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have, there's a preacher who passes through, um, and he's also kind of a, a huckster and, um, he uh, brings these relics with him that he's going to show to the people and he's going to preach in the main square and he's going to, you know, b- take up a collection. He, you know, he's a usually, he's a shyster. He's a typical kind of Boccaccio. This is how he, uh, Boccaccio seems to see a lot of, um, men of the cloth, a lot of clerics, right? Uh, Boccaccio doesn't seem to have a, a whole lot of respect for the profession. Let's just put it that way. And so the two guys, <laughs> In order to pull one over on um, this preacher, they switch out his relics. He's got one set of relics he's going to be passing off as, you know, the knuckle bones of Saint whoever. And instead he opens it up and he's got, you know, he's looking at something entirely different and he's got to figure out what to do with these <laughs> unknown objects that he's going to be selling off, uh, you know, selling to his audience as, as relics of a sainted holy man. And he pulls this off in this verbal performance that is absolutely, Absolutely. It's just dazzling. It's just like, you know, you, it, when he first begins, you know, the, the stand in for the audience, the two um, guys who have swapped out his relics on him, you get to see kind of their reaction shot and they're kind of, they're, they're, they're looking at him thinking, you know, kind of dazzled by his audacity <laughs> that he's actually going to go there with this, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then he piles it on thicker and thicker and thicker. And what Boccaccio does is he has this whole series of puns and, and he's, he's parodying kind of the sanctimonious language, you know, probably used by popular preachers at the time. Um, and it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. And it's just the most dazzling kind like, of you know, verbal invention. You know, it's just, there's something about it that's so daring, but also so like Boccaccio's uh, disrespect for the church is remarkable, but also his profound respect for language and for storytelling and for people who can build a world out of words. And, you know, people who he knows that he's got his audience in the palm of his hands. And he's like, you know, he, he just, uh, you know, by the end, he's kind of, you know, sold them so much on these, on these relics. And, um, at the same time, he's entertained, you know, the, uh, his audience within the frame, um, and, you know, us, the readers too. And it's just as, I think it's, such a touching tribute to the power of storytelling, you know, it brings us together to laugh together. Listening to Carla talk about the power of story, I'm mindful of how in this moment, like right when we're recording and when we've been having these conversations over the last few days, we're in a time when 
it's not real hard for us to make ourselves feel better, forget about what's going on, take a walk, uh, tell a story, laugh together, eat a meal together. Um, thinking about, will it still feel that way in a week's time or two weeks time? I think this sense of not just bewilderment, but kind of dislocation, this sense of uncertainty that we've been feeling, it extends to being very unsure about even the the, the short-term futures, like next week, two weeks, three weeks, what that's going to feel like. I suppose there's every possibility that it'll be worth checking in with a few friends like this in another month or so. Because mm-hmm. I think it'll feel very different. I think so. We'll see how that unfolds. In the meantime, we'd like to thank our four guests today for joining us. Thank you, Irina, Cord, Oriana, and Carla. And thank you for listening. We hope you're handling things as, as well as can be expected. And taking care of yourselves and each other. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to know what you're reading these days. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 27B. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at The Spouter Inn.